Let's pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord, my strength, and my Redeemer. Amen. John Miller reminded me of a story. Many know of Ted Turner. He is the founder of the Cable News Network and is a powerhouse in the media world. Ted is strongly opposed to Christianity and has even said that mankind has no need for Bible teaching. Imagine. Years ago, Ted Turner wanted to see if anyone had the answer to world peace. So he financed a competition to see if anyone could come up with a viable plan for peace. He would agree to purchase and print the plan in book form. 10,000 people from all around the world submitted manuscripts for Ted, for Ted to review, which he reported that not one of them presented a workable plan for world peace. Turner went on to say, without a plan, the possibility of world peace is at the best grim. And I would say, yes, it is grim if we look at it from a this world perspective. Right now, like many times in history, we need to hear the word peace. We need to see peace. We need to know it. We need to embrace it and demonstrate peace. Not only in the world, but peace in the lives we live. It's not easy. Trying to rise above and not be lured into an unnecessary argument or cause dissension when someone challenges even the good parts of your life. But may we never stop striving, and in Christ, there's always hope. To answer the question, what do you want, Jesus? I think that we know the answer. Several times through scripture this morning, one of his, his desires is peace. I try not to use the terrible situation in Ukraine for sermon examples except a rally, steady prayer, and petition for an end to a highly unjust war. Although we must not become immune to this conflict as the media fills the airways, yet it's such a reminder that the horrible events of the past, we often say will never happen again, often do. NATO was formed to help protect Europe and the world. They said never again in Europe. Well, here we are watching a revolting war, fully televised in Europe. Not about religion, but the brazen attack on a sovereign country for many misguided reasons. The biggest being power. So yes, history keeps repeating. And it's hard to find times when the world has ever known real peace, except maybe in the early stages of creation. Since time, there has been invasion upon invasion Innocent communities have fallen victim to aggressive neighbors from the days of the Old Testament to modern day. I was reminded of the problems that occur when peace and trust do not unite. We can promote peace, but can we really embrace it without trust? We need to have the trust of that other party, and they must have a trust in you to make it all work. And I think of the disciples in this passage. The disciples were hiding out, fearing for their lives after Jesus was crucified and was laid in the tomb. John 20, 19 says, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the, Jewish, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fear of the Jewish leaders, they were incredibly frightened as the Roman army and now a religious institution they had trusted were on a warpath. The body of Jesus was gone on Easter Sunday. The Roman and Jewish leadership were looking for anything to stop the event that they feared. These blasphemers are going to say this Jesus is now risen. It will empower these people and make us look foolish. We will lose control. Again, power struggles. Remember what Pam read two weeks ago for us. The guards at the tomb, Matthew 28. There could have been up to 50 guards there, consisting of both Roman soldiers and the temple guards. 
They would likely be on four-hour shifts. The consequences for an escaped prisoner or a stolen body was death. Big consequences here. And to look at Matthew's account, a violent earthquake, an angel of the Lord came down, rolled back the, sto the stone and sat on it. And I love that part. Rolled back the stone and sat on it. His clothes like lightning. The guards were so afraid they fell and shook and became dead men. The great report, Jesus is risen. And of course, the guards fully aware, how will they ever sell this one to their supervisors? They are in so much trouble as Jesus was gone. The tomb was overguarded and now completely unsealed. Jesus is gone. So they had to push a false flag operation. And where have we heard that before in the news? False flag operations. The chief priests and elders met and gave the soldiers a large sum of money, instructing them to lie. Tell others that the disciples of Jesus stole his body while you were sleeping. If this event gets to the governor, this story will keep you out of trouble. I highly doubt that. We hear this often in our faith. Oh, the body was stolen. Jesus wasn't resurrected. A simple answer. How did 11 wanted, frightened disciples sneak through 50 armed soldiers, roll a massive stone away, take the body and never get caught? So the supernatural evidence is actually the easiest explanation and most credible. Our Lord was raised from the dead. Getting back to our disciples, frightened and feeling very much alone. The doors were locked from inside. They relied on friends to drop off needed supplies or sneak around carefully to get to them. They would hide back in this house. The disciples and their followers lived in the same sort of fear our Ukrainian friends are living in. The Russian army has surrounded the steel plant in Mariupol, bombing it regularly. Hundreds of civilians and military are barricaded in the plant. And how many times has the Russian army promised a humanitarian outlet only to destroy the buses or bomb the train stations? So I wouldn't come out of hiding knowing that the fellow leading the charge was named the butcher of Syria. Not likely. So trust and peace must go together. Trust and peace. I couldn't help but reflect on how trust and peace must go. To fully trust, peace has a chance. Or when we fully trust, peace has a chance. And does Jesus ever bring this home during his post-resurrection appearances? It's not just about an empty tomb, but a living, breathing Jesus who defeated death once and for all. He was back at it again, back at it again now with a mission to reinforce and affirm his resurrection to life. And what that means to a defeated group of believers. Despite being told that he would have to suffer all those horrible things and be crucified, rise again on the third day, it was not yet a reality for the dear disciples and the disciples and the followers. And I think we would also have the same mindset, if not give up entirely on the idea of any future dreams. Complete deflation. And when we consider this incredible chapter in John, John 20, 11 to 29. Jesus now resurrected brings restoration, excitement, but most of all, peace. Now think of this, peace to Mary as he presented himself in probably the most comforting way. And can you imagine his voice saying, Mary, just brought her alive. Mary now fully recognized him and cried out to him. The fear, the turmoil, the mistrust, now bring solace to Mary. Bring solace to her. She can have peace as she trusts her master, who has never misled her or anyone else. He followed through with the promises. I will be crucified, executed, but rise again on the third day. Mary runs back to the others, locked in and hiding. She tells the story and locked doors does not stop Jesus from ministering to his dear friends. He gets in. In this locked room, Jesus is suddenly standing among them. And his first words, 
Peace be with you. To help them believe further and to comfort them, he showed the scars on his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed. Can you imagine that reunion? All those gathered, gathered in the room would feel a peace, finally a peace. Find the peace they must have thought was gone forever. Jesus in saying, peace be with you, carries a sense of the Hebrew greeting, shalom. A blessing that entails more than tranquility, but a deep sense of well-being. The kind of peace the world simply cannot give. And peace does not mean being in a place where there is no noise, no trouble, or hard work. Peace means to be in the midst of all those things and still be calm in your heart. That is the real meaning of peace. Because of the resurrection, Jesus is present in every locked room we encounter today. Those locked in the steel plant in Mariupol can experience the same living Jesus. Whatever our locked room looks like, whether it's one of sickness, heartache, emotional pain, physical enemies on the outside, Jesus is fully present. And what does he say? Peace be with you. The kind of peace the world simply cannot give. To jump down to Thomas, we know the story. Thomas wasn't there for the first appearance and didn't believe it. But a week later, we read the disciples are locked in the room again. Scripture says, though the doors were locked, Jesus stood among them again, snuck in another time. And his words, peace, peace be with you. Thomas is convinced by touching the wounds of Jesus. Jesus was instructing, put your finger here, put your hand there. Thomas is convinced by touching the wounds of Jesus. So amazing that a resurrected Lord can walk through walls, although the body is presented physically. He's certainly not a ghost. My longtime pharmacist friend, a Muslim man, greets me the same way every time, hand to his heart, he says, peace, my friend Peter. It's far more powerful than a hello to have somebody say, peace to you, my friend Peter. And I believe it to be true because he's a trustworthy, sincere man, even though we have completely different faiths and beliefs. We have a legitimate peace between us. Jesus spoke the words of peace and was the personification of peace in his life and ministry. This was also post-resurrection. Nothing changed in the mission after conquering death. Peace identified Jesus. Peace should identify Christ in us, us to others. It's vital. But oh, what a struggle sometimes. Peace is also the third character quality that Paul lists in Galatians 5. In the passage of scripture where we have a list of the characteristics that God desires to produce in us as we allow the Holy Spirit to be in control of our lives. And I did want to cover a couple interesting verses in this, this chapter of John related to our post-resurrection Jesus. Verses that might be a little confusing. John 20, 17, Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I've not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. This response is to Mary Magdalene, who just realized that the person speaking to her at the empty grave is Jesus. The term Jesus used here, Greek, is hapto, which implies a close clutching action. Later, Jesus will invite others to physically touch him. So his meaning here does not seem to be that Mary should not contact him or touch him at all. Many commentators believe that it likely means that she's not to stay there or keep clinging to him, but that she needs to go and tell the disciples what she has seen. It's urgent and it's vital. The rest of the verse is amazing. The details of Jesus' statement are somewhat vague, but he refers to the disciples as brothers, reinforcing the idea of salvation as a spiritual adoption by God. We'll find that in Hebrews 2. Referring to the Father as both his God and their God also echoes the same idea. Christ also refers to his ascension, which will come as he leaves the apostles to grow the new church. 
And the next verse I just wanted to look at quickly. Again, it's 20, uh, John 20, 21 to 23. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And, that, and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Interesting, right? So this sounds a little like we're involved in sin forgiveness. That would be a resounding no, although an odd verse. It's important to explain this briefly and also a great reminder why the original Greek can help us a little, although I've battled through Greek all my seminary time. <laughs> Jesus' remark about forgiveness comes because the disciples are being reminded and guided by the Spirit of God. In no sense at all does Christ mean that the forgiveness of sin is being determined by the disciples or that they are choosing whether to absolve others of sin. So please bear with me for the answer. The original Greek language uses more easily defined tenses. So it comes across more clearly, emphasizing that such sins have already been forgiven or have already been retained. Guided by the truth of the Holy Spirit and in keeping with his truth, these men will be able to accurately declare whether others are abiding by those truths. I might call that discernment as well. And maybe you get this better than I, but this chapter in John is really worth a Bible study. So that's enough theology and exegesis. That paragraph alone does give me a headache. But thank you, Lord, for giving us the many tools to understand and the best one, your Holy Spirit. The disciples, the early followers, were struggling with trust. Their world had collapsed in front of them and trust was miles away from them. They thought Jesus would rule the world, and they would finally experience the worldly peace they expected. Even though Jesus was now alive and among them, many had not yet seen Jesus. Many were confused. Jesus was popping in and out of the picture, very different than his pre-cross ministry. Not business as usual. Jesus appeared only to his disciples or followers. No public sermons, no healings or confrontations with the religious leaders. The crux of our Christian faith, Jesus was not resuscitated, but resurrected. The end of the ages had come, and Jesus' resurrection was a foretaste and a guarantee of the future resurrection to life. This time, post-resurrection, Jesus is all about encouraging, embracing, building trust, peace, and empowering his disciples to do the work of the Father. Kingdom work, go into all the world and make disciples, build the infant church. So let's bring this home. Wouldn't it be great to really be at peace? To close your eyes and be alone with your heart and not feel scattered, not hectic, not hurried, not stretched, but rather to feel calm, to feel solid, to feel centered, to feel that all is well. Wouldn't it be great to wake up in the morning and smile, welcoming the day ahead, because deep in your soul, you are at peace with yourself and your life. Wouldn't it be great to have something difficult or painful come hurtling toward you and be able to react, not with panic or fear, but with a calm assurance that whatever the problem, you know God is going to walk you through it and even bring good out of it. Wouldn't it be great to be truly and honestly, at peace. That is the peace that Jesus can bring. He came to bring it. We find peace in Jesus, real peace, no false flags, because we can have ultimate trust in him. He kept every promise and never misled anyone. He is the son of God, and through him, he has promised eternal life and peace forever to those who know and believe in him. So what does Jesus want? Trust, which gives you that peace and the ability to truly know him when he says, peace be with you. I'm sending you in peace. Go in peace. May the locked door where the disciples were hiding out be thought of as the Lord's safe place. He will protect you on the inside and from those on the outside. 
no matter what your locked door resembles, no bar barrier, will, barrier will stop him from entering and bringing peace to your life. Trust in the one who can give what the world will never be able to provide. I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. And praise be to God. Might I close with, peace be with you. And might you say, and with you, bless you, church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we have peace with God by grace through faith, the finished work of Christ. And thank you that in him we have the peace of God to guard our hearts and minds. Thank you that we have your peace reigning in our hearts. And we pray that we may be a faithful witness to the truth of the glorious gospel of Jesus. Knowing that the Christian life is not easy, but joy comes in the morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.